So again, thank you for choosing to be here today to be part of our webinar to continue the conversation on celebrating the contributions of our rural women with our webinar theme on rural women sowing seeds of growth and change in the Pacific. We are very fortunate to have our six inspiring panelists here, representatives from the agribusiness community, the agriculture ministry and regional programs, Pharma Plus and PESA Plus implementation programs, and from the regional organization, the Secretariat of the Pacific Community, SBC. Okay, just looking at the chat to know who's coming in. I see, thank you, participants from Tonga, Samoa, dialing in, Australia. Welcome, Fiji, Cook Islands, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands. So it is now 2.03 p.m. Samoa time, and we will now make an official start. New ways coming in, Malolava, New Zealand. Thank you again for being here. So in line with our Pacific culture and traditions, I will lead us with a prayer. So let us bow our heads and pray. Mato te tu a fia lo a fio le nei tu la le a solo mato te ma. Faftai lo lo fa malo anga le ya sa mo. I may say to no umo le to pass speaker. Thank you for all our beautiful Pacific women and leaders, our men, our children, youth people with disabilities, our development partners, Australia and New Zealand, who have made this gathering possible. Our beautiful panelists and everyone joining us here today. May this session be useful for sharing and learning from each other. Bless each and every one of us here today and may the glory be yours forever in Jesus name, amen. So again, talo falawa, nisa bula, malo lele kiorana, hi, hello, and welcome to our webin webinar. So let me start with a brief introduction. I'm Cassandra Beetham, the Jetsi Manager for Pharma Plus. And I'm very honored to be here and we'll be moderating the first part of our program. And my colleague, Melissa Collins, our Jetsi advisor is also excited to be here and she will be leading us through the second part of our program. So we aim to have a one hour webinar and in terms of what we hope to cover here today, I will provide a brief introduction on the webinar objectives. Then we'll introduce each of our panel members to present and there will be six minutes for each presentation. And this will be followed by the second part of the webinar, the question and answer session with a time of about 15 minutes being allocated to this. So please note that there is the Q&A option on Zoom for participants to pose questions as our speakers are presenting and Melissa will be monitoring these. She may be able to respond live to some of the questions. Otherwise, these will be asked to the panelists for them to respond to during the Q&A session. So, don't, so please do indicate which panelists you would like us to address the question to. Melissa will then provide closing remarks and officially close our webinar. So again, welcome and looking forward to our hour together. So let me now provide a brief intro on Pharma Plus and the webinar objectives. So Pharma Plus is an aid for trade, horticulture and agriculture market access program funded by Australia and New Zealand supporting economic growth and improved rural livelihoods for the people of 10 Pacific countries by being commercially focused, export oriented, sustainable and inclusive. So in the current phase of our program, there is a strong focus on inclusion and in achieving JETSI outcomes. And we hope that the webinar will bring us together, building linkages and coalition and continuing the dialogue on the invaluable contributions of our rural women, building awareness and in turn nudging some of those negative social and cultural norms. Not only are women invaluable contributors to agriculture, undertaking subsistence and commercial farming and agriculture and food production roles, in addition to being primary caregivers in their families, but they are also, they can be also be seeds of change and growth in their communities, championing new ideas, bringing in new skills and experiences and empowering those around them. 
So the main objective for us today is on celebrating the role of rural women in the Pacific, and our panelists will be highlighting a few of these contributions to change and growth. And in doing this, they will also touch on some of the barriers and impediments and the opportunities to deliver gender equality and inclusive growth in Pacific Island countries. I will stop here and move on to the next part of our program for introducing our panelists for their presentations. So it is now 2.08 p.m. Some more time. And it is my pleasure to introduce to you our first speaker, our very own Emily Tumakon, the Farmer Plus Country Manager for Vanuatu. So briefly before joining Farmer Plus um, in 2019, Emily held a range of senior government positions in the Ministry of Agriculture, Trade and Internal Affairs. In her spare time, she runs a consultancy specializing in policy planning, advice and implementation for food safety and food control systems, biosecurity, agriculture and environment. Today, Emily will share with us Pharma Plus, what Pharma Plus is doing to support women in agriculture in Vanuatu and highlight some of the trailblazing women we are working with. Thank you. The floor is yours, Emily. Thank you, um, moderator. Um, can we have uh, the slides up, uh, Walter, please? So today I will be speaking on the strengths of uh, rural Vanuatu women in agribusiness, uh, a Pharma Plus perspective. Next. Next slide. So as uh, the moderator mentioned, it's a uh, program co-funded by Australia and New Zealand and managed by DT Global and the 10 countries, uh, the countries that are up there, Fiji, PNG, Samoa, Solomon Islands, Tonga, Vanuatu, and including Cook Islands, Kiribati, Niue, and Tuvalu. So just going on a bit further about uh, the program, initially its focus was mostly to assist the uh, recipient countries to improve their market access capabilities for their products. And in the latter phase of the program, we've expanded uh, their scope to our scope to uh, addressing production and processing deficiencies of the recipient countries. The program re originally started with six countries, and in this uh, last two phase, uh, we've uh, included ten other Pacific Island countries. We are using the what we call the MSD approach, market systems development. Uh, it is a Good approach to measure the impact of the support that we're providing uh, to uh, impact the livelihoods of our people. But uh, however, uh, from experience, it has shown that the results of this support takes time to be realized. Next slide, please. So, the rural Vanuatu women uh, comprises 51% of our total population. 75% of these women are rural dwellers and are mostly engaged in agribusiness type activities. Our focus for today will be on women uh, who are involved in the business of kava and cacao. And these are the two focus sectors that the country is uh, working in. And just to also um, inform you all that traditionally uh, the kava and cacao sectors have been uh, dominated by men. Kava and cacao both require tedious hands uh, and fingers and a lot of patience to be able to achieve the desired quality and even uh, to consistently produce uh, the quality that the market wants. And this is where I think a woman's finer instead steadier hands and fingers are required. The challenges of rural women uh, are, some, some are uh, stated here, lack of capital, always uh, something that uh, we do not have uh, in hand to uh, start a agribusiness. The lack of uh, business acumen, uh, having some 
uh, knowledge about how to run a business, lack of empowerment. And also traditionally they've uh, not been able to get support of other family members and especially their, from their husbands or partners. In uh, the Melanesia, uh, which Vanuatu is one of the Melanesian countries, cultural status of women in society and uh, communities can also uh, uh, be a challenge. Um, another recent one that has come up uh, is the young men and husbands going out for seasonal work programs in Australia and New Zealand. It's, it's, as meant, it's meant that women have uh, needed to uh, have needed to be to attend to uh, family obligations because of the absence of the, the partner. Pharma Plus and Rural Women. So what are we doing as, as a program working in the region? So we have uh, created partnership agreements uh, with uh, business partners or uh, entities uh, to be able to come in and uh, see how we can improve the livelihoods and uh, of course uh, have, uh, uh, have uh, women champions. So through uh, our partnerships uh, in the cacao and uh, kava sectors, uh, we've been able to support uh, Gaston Chocolat uh, and the VPPA, Vanuatu Primary Producers uh, Authority. This was in, in our last phase. And uh, we are looking at partnering with two other companies in this new phase, which are, which are Vanuatu Wise and Active. And the pictures that you can see down below on the left is a picture of a key farmer that uh, Gaston Chocolat uh, was working with, and um, she is a key farmer uh, in the cocoa sector. And uh, she, uh, we have uh, supported through uh, the program uh, providing um, technology, a simple uh, technology, and the use of solar dryers to help her improve the uh, quality of uh, cacao that uh, she is producing. So, with the partnership with Gaston Chocolat. She, um, he had four key agents uh, uh, and out of the four, one is a female and that's the picture of the lady uh, there. Uh, and her name is Lillian Puktan. And through the program, we found out that from the experience we found with Gaston Chocolat as a partner that she provides a better quality compared to the other three um, key agents. So. She actually has uh, demonstrated uh, also over the years that she's increased her uh, supply of uh, cacao beans to Gaston as a partner. Next slide, please. Now, this is a picture just showing some of the women who are engaged uh, under the partnership that we had with the uh, VPPA, the Primary Producers Authority. So through this uh, support that uh, was through the program, we provided uh, also again, uh, basic technology, the use of solar dryers. And these are four women uh, that uh, were um, supported uh, through the partnership to uh, build, to have uh, uh, solar dryers built and they are using the solar dryers. They are at uh, household level and uh, the sizes are also um, enough for uh, each uh, family to use. Rural women and uh, need economic empowerment. We also in this space, we, are, we have had uh, um, discussions with uh, the Department of Women's Affairs to be able to create a, uh, an MOU, a partnership where we can come in to assist some of these women in the area of economic empowerment in running um, uh, rural trainings, especially on basic financial literacy. And this is an MOU that's in the pipeline and we are in discussion with Women's Affairs also tying in the Vanuatu National Council of Women and the Vanuatu Women's Center 
who we will be um, using also uh, the members uh, under this institution. Uh, it is also noteworthy to state that uh, some women are pioneers in these sectors. As I mentioned earlier, that this is a sector that um, uh, these sectors are male, male dominated. So the two ladies here in the picture, they have become very um, strong women uh, that have engaged with women in rural areas, especially farmers. And now they, they are actually active uh, cover exporters uh, in the in the cover in the cover sector and um, how they came about to starting uh, their businesses through their um, um, collaborations uh, or their they're working with the women in the rural areas that uh, they come from that has driven them to be able to get into uh, this uh, the, this sector uh, in this agribusiness sector and to be able to continue to do the work uh, that they're doing. And uh, a good example also that uh, for the partner that we're looking at partnering with uh, in this phase, uh, Vanuatu Wise, uh, through her business, uh, with working with Kava farmers from where she comes from, uh, during uh, humanitarian um, uh, needs, she's still there to, to support them, uh, such as the recent cyclone that went through Vanuatu. She was able to step up also and go back and uh, help the, the women, uh, the rural women uh, in her community. Next slide, please. And one other thing that uh, Pharma Plus has also been able uh, to use uh, through its uh, uh, use in its network is uh, the capacity training for a model that uh, was introduced uh, for the family farm teams. And this model has uh, helped to uh, define the different roles of each family member and also uh, allowing uh, every member to be part of a decision making in a household or family setup. So the family farm teams has been a model that's been rolled out through the Farm Plus program and uh, it has proven uh, quite effective uh, in Vanuatu, and this is something that uh, going into this next phase, we will continue with it, and that's the, the uh, partnership that's in the pipeline uh, with the Department of uh, Women's Affairs. So just to end uh, my uh, presentation, I'd just like to share that uh, Women and girls are equal shareholders in the Pacific rural agriculture systems. They are sensible, determined, resourceful, and creative. Let's include them more in decision-making, equip them with the correct survey and tools to enhance Pacific's food security, trade, and rural livelihoods. Thank you, Tomas. And back to you, moderator. Thank you, Tomas. Emily? Our next speaker is an organic vanilla farmer, e-commerce entrepreneur, champion of women in agriculture and food warrior, promoting the organic farm to table movement, Shelley Burek. Shelley is a passionate supporter and facilitator of women's empowerment in agriculture. In addition to operating her own vanilla farm, Wawala Vanilla, Shelley has held positions including president of the Samoan Women Association of Growers and secretary of the Samoan Agriculture Association. And like many people across the Pacific and the world, COVID and the associated border closures forced Shelley to pivot and reconsider her business model to stay afloat. Today, she will share a little of her story with us. Baftai, and over to you, Shelley, for your presentation. Baftai, Tele Lava, Cassandra. First of all, I'd just like to apologize if there's a bit of a lag in my internet um, connectivity. And also being a farmer and uh, zooming into this webinar from home, I do have a husband who's doing work in the background. So just in case you hear machinery, <laughs> the challenges of a woman entrepreneur. So I'm very happy to be here uh, this afternoon and excited to be part of this webinar. And I thank Farmer Plus for inviting me to be here today. So my topic today is 
diversifying an agribusiness to e-commerce and the opportunities for sowing the seeds for change. First of all, I just want to acknowledge that I am an Indigenous Samoan entrepreneur and I hail from the villages of Solo Solo, Balea Siu, Papa Satawa in Sawai, uh, Popoza, and Bailima. So, Papatai Lava. Understanding digital technology and e commerce is scary and often a far reaching idea for many women entrepreneurs, particularly for the vulnerable and rural com communities where access to simple, easy to understand e-commerce training with local help and support can be lacking. As an Indigenous Samoan woman, I have a unique insight of the intricacies, complexities, and barriers for Pacific women to engage in business. I have experience and understanding on how business is conducted as a businesswoman, I am an experienced agribusiness commercial vanilla farmer with e-commerce experience from being a graduate of a recent uh, Indigenous e-commerce business program. I built my own e-commerce store and website and then went on to become a Shopify partner in Samoa. As an experienced leader of women and health civil society organizations, a woman entrepreneur and farmer, I have experienced firsthand the many challenges and barriers faced by women entrepreneurs in the Pacific. Since the outbreak of COVID-19 and the global pandemic that was declared in December 2019, countries across the globe mobilized to respond to the health crisis, and to manage the significant socio-economic impacts that occur as a result of this pandemic. The spread of COVID-19 affected people's livelihoods substantially on a global scale. And evidence from the UN Women Report called Unlocking the Lockdown, the Gendered Effects of COVID-19 on Achieving the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, in Asia and the Pacific, reports that almost one third of the female population in Samoa relies on the internet to learn about COVID-19. And this reveals a keen use of mobile technology for women to access and benefit from online information and resources in country. The family and community are central to the role of women in the Pacific. In most village community households, women account for most of the unpaid domestic work and care for elderly parents, unwell family members and children. In many cases, when an economic decision is needed, women are asked to give up their own aspirations and business dreams to look after the family household and to redirect finances towards the men's economic pursuits. As a result, women often have less time to devote to economic pursuits outside of the home. E-commerce can help to overcome this. It is not bound by a set physical location or established business hours and doesn't require the same overhead commitment as a shop front. E-commerce allows these women who are left at home to create or expand their business, gain access to a much bigger potential market through the creation of a small online business, contribute to the family household and their own savings income. We all know Indigenous people are great storytellers. And for many generations, we have learned from our elders, our family traditions and culture through storytelling. Successful women entrepreneurs have a story to tell, a story that can motivate and support more women to become economically empowered through positive role modeling and self-belief. For me, COVID can be viewed as a blessing 
and that it pushed me to look at more efficient and effective ways of expanding and doing business. I was forced to think fast on my feet and diversify and pivot into e-commerce to maintain and expand my business presence dom domestically and internationally. Two years ago, I took a leap of faith and transitioned from full-time employment and a secure income stream into my vanilla business, which was, until then, only a part-time hobby business that couldn't afford to pay me a salary. Fast forward two years, my business is making good sales revenue and a modest end of year profit. I can afford to pay myself a small salary. I am creating separate savings accounts from that revenue and I can contribute more to the household bills. We are steadily growing. My pathway has taken me from being an agribusiness Varala Vanilla to becoming online and with my own website. And I have expanded a massive social, social media presence and visibility because of going onto e-commerce. I've created my own YouTube channel, which is also generating a lot of followers and interest in what I do as a vanilla farmer here in Samoa. I am an organic vanilla trainer and mentor for Samoa and online. And through my YouTube uh, channel and Facebook presence, I actually have people contacting me from Africa, Solomon Islands, Australia, asking me to show them how to grow vanilla and in actual fact have invited me to come and do some vanilla training workshops there. So wonderful. Um, I mentioned that I am a Shopify partner here in Samoa, and that means that I can build e-commerce Shopify websites for Pacific women entrepreneurs. And at the moment, I am putting together a Pacific team of Shopify store builders, of women entrepreneurs who can also help build e-commerce stores for the Pacific region. I am a RISE 2025 facilitator, RISE 2025 being an Indigenous coaching and e-commerce network for Indigenous women. I am also on the ground support for another Indigenous e-commerce program called Kahao. I am also an, the FAO SID Solutions Innovator, um, where I have done a collaboration with USP Alafour and Fiji for vanilla training workshops in Samoa and social media marketing and promotions for Rawala Vanilla. I am an e-commerce mentor for the Pacific Greenpreneurs Incubator Program. I am a business, business Link Pacific approved advisor for digital and online solutions. And I am the e-commerce and vanilla consultant for the Samoa Women's Association of Growers. And all of this has happened in two years since I went on to e-commerce. I am a self-taught e-commerce woman entrepreneur who understands the fear and self-doubt of diversifying a comfortable business into e-commerce and an area that is unfamiliar and daunting. I know what the challenges are to make e-commerce work in a technical and financial environment that is not yet designed fully to readily accept international payments to our own local bank accounts, meaning a lot of our commercial banks have closed payment gateways but in my role, I, I am advocating for these to be open. Taking Vauala Vanilla from being just a normal agribusiness to a successful and authentic e-commerce business based in the South Pacific is proof anything is possible if you have the right mindset and ambition and are given the right tools, resources, and support. By sharing my story today in this webinar, it is my hope 
that I will have inspired at least one Indigenous woman grower, farmer, or entrepreneur to take that leap of faith with your business and look for the opportunities that will help you diversify and pivot your own agribusiness into e-commerce. The only limitations we have are the ones we put on ourselves. Again, Fafatai Shelley, um, we saw some hands go up and then down again. So I was just wondering if that was a reminder for us to remind um, the participants if you had any questions to put those, to pose them in the Q&A um, Zoom option. Okay, um, our third panelist is um, Catherine Pianga, and she is the co-founder and long-standing executive officer of the PNG Women in Coffee Association, WICA, a member-based organization that supports um, women coffee producers in PNG. So WICA aims to recognize the valuable contribution of women in coffee and to provide them with a vehicle to access capacity building, training, and network opportunities and to support a more inclusive value chain. Catherine will present on how a woman-led PNG wicker in a male-dominated but women-responsive PNG coffee industry is upsetting status quo and paving the way for recognition of women's participation in the industry. Welcome, Catherine, for your presentation. Thank you, Pharma Plus. Uh, so yes, it sounds like a very complex uh, topic to speak to, but really it's very simple and straightforward in terms of what uh, PNG Women in Coffee is doing in the coffee industry space. So, but before I go into what Women in Coffee uh, are doing, I'll just take a step back and just uh, try to project the context within which we operate. So basically, uh, coffee in Papua New Guinea is really a rural-based uh, economy. So uh, villages grow coffee, which is a obviously a commercial, uh, commercial crop, but it's grown by villages and especially those who are uh, in very rural and remote parts of the country. Uh, so I'm going to quickly uh, project the traditional rural uh, PNG sort of context, but I'm just zooming in on uh, Western Islands experience. Uh, so in, uh, in PNG, very quickly, both men and women, uh, boy and girl have a role to play in families, communities, and of course country. And some roles are acquired instinctively, others are learned, and others still by association. Uh, not knowing what to do regardless of gender makes one a liability in our community. So societies past and present have thrived because people knew their roles. So I think uh, I thought that's important to just say those few words. Uh, in terms of traditional uh, patrimonial PNG, in particular Western Highlands province, uh, land as a factor of production is passed down through the male lineage. Uh, however, it is our women who keep uh, land under production. Uh, today, my user right to land is determined by how industrious women in my family were in farming the land. So basically turning seeds into food for sustenance. The children she bears, the food garden she produces, and the animals she raises are firms of value as a woman of high standing in her family and community. So her father's house receives different customary token of appreciation for bride price uh, to when she bears a child at pay to when she's old, they pay for her bones. And sorry to speak in those terms, but uh, that's, that's the kind of value that society places on women in our traditional context. Um, uh, so really women are classified as very, um, as, as, you know, valued highly in our patrilineal uh, PNG, especially in Western Highlands province. Now, in terms of uh, seeds for growth, when we understand the context, uh, it is essential to project and contribute to chains. So as we all know, and we appreciate, there is no one size fits all when it comes to context. So uh, in contemporary PNG, PNG Women in Coffee Association works with uh, existing traditional appreciations to advance our work in rural traditional coffee communities. PNG Women in Coffee Association is really, as uh, mentioned, is a needed industry-based structural intervention in a male-dominated PNG's coffee industry 
by women, for women and family and youth. So just for the, uh, uh, for, for the purpose of our uh, event, I just want to quickly touch on our vision. Uh, PNG Women in Coffee as an association, our vision is so that women who are involved in the coffee value chain live meaningful and sustainable lives. Our mission is to empower women in coffee communities in PNG to achieve meaningful, sustainable lives and encourage and recognize women's participation in all segments of the coffee industry. And our goal is to improve livelihoods and socioeconomic status of rural women who depend on coffee and empower women coffee farmers and entrepreneurs along the coffee value chain. So we are a gender-based membership oriented network marketing system in the coffee value chain. There are a number of problems that we set out to uh, arrest or address uh, in this uh, intervention as PNG Women in Coffee. Uh, and our problems are not new. I think they are universal in, in some uh, cases. So like in the coffee industry in PNG, we have, uh, uh, we want to contribute to addressing issues of non-women friendly legislative and regulatory environment no representation on the coffee industry board, uh, cultural limitations and indifferences, including access to land, uh, the increasing lawlessness, uh, especially in the coffee industry, because coffee is a cash crop. And many a times we experience theft, poor access to coffee infrastructure that is milling and roasting facilities. We have poor road access, high coffee freighting charges, especially if we're bringing coffee in from rural areas. Uh, we have reduced access to poorly uh, managed health facilities. So those are some of the other issues that affect us women. They're cross-cutting issues, but they are quite prevalent in a, in a coffee, um, coffee industry setting. So these are some of the issues that uh, women in coffee tries to um, address in, a, in, in what she does for, the, for, the, for her members. Um, so Women in Coffee, we, as, as, a, as, a, as an association, we try to provide a platform as a catalyst for change uh, to give voice to an ill-represented and yet important stakeholder of the coffee industry, women and youth, and to operate through partnership and collaboration with other local organizations and expertise to bring about conducive environment for women and families who are in coffee so that they can contribute to live a sustainable life and contribute meaningfully to growth and change. So uh, this, to, there are one or two, two, two um, elements that I want to focus on. One is the cash and financial literacy area. So our traditional rural families and communities are affected by the availability of cash during coffee flash seasons. Cash brings in a complex dimension to traditional way of life and plays a significant role in sifting and upsetting gender roles and balance of power. For a people who are not prepared to handle cash, cash has brought about many challenges. So financial literacy is critical for our rural coffee growers. Training our rural members in how to plan and budget cash that is available to a family unit or an individual is important. Some of our members have undergone uh, training such as personal viability offered by Entrepreneurial Development Training Center, which is a training uh, certified by the PNG Training Council. Personal viability is about building sustainable enterprises. Our members need to break down, uh, our members need to break from a mindset of coffee as a, a subsistence cash crop to coffee as business. So here participants learn by playing reality games that enable them to acquire and develop a business oriented mindset and the knowledge and skills needed to establish and run a successful micro enterprise. Personal viability is about holistic human development. Participants are encouraged to identify the good in their lives and keep them and remove the bad. It is all about training individuals to develop themselves both spiritually, mentally, physically, emotionally, and financially. So it's a holistic uh, uh, approach to the development of, of, the, of the person. It helps with the development of mindset. Because of our cultural context, we find that it's very important to help uh, somebody provide an opportunity for someone to, to see themselves in a mirror and to aspire to become the better person that they are. 
So uh, in facilitating appropriate training such as personal viability with family-based network marketing, we are seeing a change in the attitude of men. Members, for example, have, who have undertaken the personal viability training have demonstrated a change in mindset. Men actually now treating their women or their wife with respect and appreciate that women had value to their families and communities. We observe that women and girls exert have full control of, of uh, potential and capability where a living and working environment is conducive and favorable and where her self-worth is appreciated and reaffirmed. Where mindset is still problematic, women coffee farmers were supplying coffee, for example, to Jiwaka Coffee Limited, um, would ask uh, the company director, Emma Wakpi, to withhold a portion of their payment for when they would need it. In another scenario, in the case of Corona Coffee Limited, in agreement with farmers, Maureen Cahento, company director, was withheld portion of coffee payments until sufficient for farmers to purchase tin roofing materials to build their house, for instance. So um, while we are, uh, bringing in different uh, training to help with developing the person in our value chain. We are also trialing other approaches uh, kind of on the spot. Uh, there is no real experience in the chain in terms of um, uh, who's doing what, the kind of experiences that we can share. Although we have accumulated some experiences, there are instances where some members have to trial and error. And so some of the learning are quite new and where it is working our as, as Women in Coffee Network, our intention is to multiply that, replicate that in other settings. Because we, our, our communities are quite different from one cultural setting to another. So. So that's, that's our approach and we are learning from each other as we grow together. Now in terms of uh, uh, technical support, Women in Coffee is not a technical organization. We rely on experts such as Coffee Industry Corporation and industry service providers to provide us with training in, in methods of coffee husbandry all the way through to uh, understanding uh, coffee cup flavors, uh, which is Sorry, Catherine, I think we've lost you. Catherine, I'm not sure if you can hear, but we've um, lost the connection. Okay, well, so Philippe, if you can just let um, Catherine know that we've lost the connection with her, but we'll thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, for your presentation. We'll move on to our next um, presenter, Mrs. Tamarama Anguana Kamana. Um, please share with us your story. I'm just noting that we're a little bit behind time, so apologies um, if I'm missing the introduction part. Mrs. Tamarama, the floor is yours. Thank you, Cassandra. And I did, I was making notes that um, I know you had only allocated us one hour and we have still two more speakers um, following me. So I'll try and keep it as uh, short and concise as possible, but also trying to provide uh, the information that I think our, our uh, participants want to hear. First, let me say what an inspiring story listening to Shelley. And um, I wouldn't mind that happening uh, for us in the Cook Islands. But first and foremost, kia orana, and thank you to Pharma Plus for the opportunity to be part of this forum today and the participants that have tuned in. What can I say? Agriculture is no longer just a men only role. Women are overcoming barriers to establish businesses in the agricultural sector, just like Shelley. We have two young women, vanilla farmers, with one exporting to the United States. We have women who have established hydroponic farms in the outer islands and supplying vegetables to the local market. We have women with established businesses selling oils, clothing, craft, and our weekly markets are full of women selling their produce, root crops, garlands, 
fruit juices to cater to our local market and our returning tourism market. We have women using an online platform to sell their produce in country. Customers place an order and the products are delivered to their doorstep. When you look across the agriculture value chain in the Cook Islands, women are playing a much bigger role. They are working as producers, traders, processors, business managers, mentors, and providing food security. In addition to their role as mother, wife, grandmother, teacher, public servants, and the like. So the Ministry of Agriculture recognizes the importance of the role that women or we regularly and we regularly maintain contact with them to hear their challenges and successes. We are developing profiles of women to celebrate their achievements. We are involving women in overseas training opportunities normally res uh, reserved for men. In July this year, we sent a female beekeeper to Fiji to attach and learn value adding products with the Fiji Beekeepers Association. Our own ministry has a female livestock officer who attends the welfare calls on livestock on her own. So agriculture and all its um, areas are no longer limited to men only. My ministry continues to look for opportunities with development partners, uh, which include SBC, FAO, Pharma Plus, to advocate the need to provide women with access to necessary finance and resources, including promoting the use of appropriate technology to assist them scale up their businesses. As a country with a small agriculture sector and an even smaller labor force, we recognize the need to be inclusive. Men, women and youth working together to restore agriculture back to its former status as a key sector in the Cook Islands economy. Today, there is no benchmark women cannot achieve from a political landscape, business, community, agric agriculture sector, they can achieve if given the opportunity and resources to do so and empowered with the relevant knowledge. I thank you for your time and attention. Kirana e kia manuia. Me taki maata, Mrs. Timaranma. Our next speaker is Florence Rahiria, who believes that rural women and girls hold significant power in their catalytic role in contributing nutritious food resources to their communities and actively advocates for solutions that will support women to access training and to equip them with the appropriate skills to adapt and contextualize new technologies and approaches to their own context. We will now hear from Mrs. Florence on the contribution of SBC on empowering rural women. The floor is yours, Florence. Uh, thank you, Cassandra, um, and greetings, everyone. Um, wow, just listening to all, everyone's presentation so far, I think um, I just wanted to um, come in from the regional perspective um, for some of you who don't may not be familiar with the Pacific community or SPC. So SPC works in more than 20 different sectors. Um, we're known for the knowledge creation, knowledge generation and, in the, in, and the innovations that we create around um, certain sectors like in fishery science and in public health surveillance and geoscience, energy, water, and then where my division is, is uh, the land resources division, where we do a lot of work that's around agriculture and forestry. So the land-based resources um, around genetics, conservation of genetic resources um, that supports food security, just to name a few. So our program of work obviously will have impact on rural women, whether it's through the work that we support our member countries, in policy development or in the technical and scientific skills um, training or um, capacity building that we carry out on the ground in country, they all have uh, impact on women as well. So through our work in trying to uh, gender mainstream or try to empower women, we often, you know, it, it's, it's clearly that we recognize that the needs and the concerns and the knowledge of our Pacific rural women is really, really critical in terms of how we achieve as a region our development goals. Um, Pacific women, they play a very critical role, uh, role in defining what Pacific resilience means. I think that, uh, that, that that's a value that they bring to the scene and just reflecting on what Emily talked about in terms of 
um, the experience of Vanuatu women where they were the first, first responders to climate change in Bexa. So we can see that women not only are at the forefront of household you know, provision of uh, food and consumption of food or um, assisting um, with family, but they're also uh, are there as the first responders in all um, events, even with um, critical events around natural disasters and so forth. So at our division, the Land Resources Division, we, um, as I said earlier, we, we provide that scientific and technical advice and support to the member countries. But when we're doing that, whether it be in forestry, um, sustainable forest management, or whether it's around uh, sustainable agricultural practices and production, um, supporting or countering the challenges that we face with production, agriculture production, or whether it's about improving market access, certainly one of the, of course, the integral part of our work is ensuring that our people, uh, we, 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 we put our people at the center of our development focus. So here in SPC, we, um, we, we, made, we, we, we sort of carry out an approach where we call it the people-centered approach. And that's basically putting people and their environment at the center of our development at, at the initial planning stages, um, at the implementation stage. Um, we try to do that so that we not only um, look at it from a gender perspective, but we try to integrate the cultural aspect that shape the Pacific so our people-centered approach is looking at both um, gender, but looking at what approaches um, fit within our cultural context, and also looking at how we can continue to sustainably um, support our, our environment. Um, so we do, we do a lot of work, and I just want to touch on a few things as examples of the kind of support that um, the Land Resources Division um, provides to our members. And it, it's around capacity and policy policy development, but also in capacity. So we try to um, fo focus our support around creating strategic partnerships. So we're working with women organizations within the member countries, or we're also looking at um, creating practical tools that our our um, technical teams can take out and, and use when they're talking about gender. Um, we, we do a lot of science as well as um, development in our, in our field. And it's often very difficult for technical people to go out and explain um, gender mainstreaming or integrate gender into their work. So one of the key challenges we've had as an organization is understanding ourselves for ourselves what gender means for us in our regional space. Um, so we've, we've supported um, mainly in our organic, I'll talk a little bit about our organic, um, our work around the organic value chains and the support we've been providing to countries such as Solomon Islands and Palau, where we've created space for um, you know a wider um, situ uh, wider engagements with various communities to to not only look at developing policies around gender agenda gender, but also when they're looking in the organic space to not only create policies about gen uh, organic for them, but also to look at the role of women and men in that value chain as well. So that's been some of the work we've been doing in countries like Solomon Islands and in countries uh, also in, in Palau. Uh, we're also moving into that space with Kiribati. Um, some of the other things that have come up through our value chain work is again, understanding the role of rural women in value chains as well. Like for instance, if you look at uh, Marshall Islands, for instance, pandanas is a very important crop for the country. Um, and a lot of it is, it's important because it's its part of the rural activities for the communities. And a lot of women are involved in that in that space where they create um, um, income generation opportunities out of that crop for them. So when we're looking at those specific value chains to go in and unpack what, what that means for the women that are involved in that value chain, um, so the, those are kind of some of the examples we've we've kind of seen and and we've we've been also you know forestry is one of our key areas and often we talk about agriculture we think about food production and food consumption and and that at, 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 but when you think about agriculture as a whole it's a whole system we don't have the natural resources to support agriculture what happens 
um, after that. So we have applied a lot of systems thinking. And I like the mention of Pharma Plus um, around the rollout of the farm, family farm teams. And you know, I've worked in Papua New Guinea before doing this role, and I know that the family farm teams approach has been rolled out in different commodities, in coffee, in fisheries, you know, and so forth. But that's an area that in the region, I, I think that hasn't been um, fully rolled out, but that is a game changer. I think in PN in the PNG context, that was a game changer. And that's something that um, SPC, um, especially in our work with the Land Resources Division, we've understood that that could be an approach that could support, especially when we're looking at our agroforestry work where um, agroforestry is growing food among trees and you have to get the whole family involved because when you plant a tree, it's, it's gonna stand there for you know, 10, 20 years and family have to make a decision around what food crops they grow and what trees they grow. So, We've, we've been interested in that role and um, in, in the family farm teams approach, and we're trying some of those to complement what I've said earlier on our people-centered approach, because I think um, for us to move forward, contextualizing technologies, I think that continues to be the language that we often talk to um, within our, our, our area, because unless women see themselves at the start of the development of a technology, and they put inputs into it at the end of them, you know, that's more important than bringing a technology afterwards. Um, often they tell us that technologies are developed, um, you know, agricultural technologies or time, cons time saving technologies have often been developed with the understanding of a man's value adding to a man. Um, but I think in this space, uh, we all have a role in creating a narrative, a clear narrative and a visible narrative for women in agriculture. I think that they'll continue to impact positively on us as we go forward. So I'm kind of rushing here because I don't want to take up the, a lot of time. So any, I'm happy to take questions afterwards. Thank you. Over to you, Cassandra. Inaka Florence, I just going to know that Florence, um, that we have run out of time but um, understand that some may need to leave, uh, but we encourage you to, to do reach out to our panelists through us and we'll make the connection. So um, moving on to our last and final um, panel member, um, our only male on the panel, on the panel. So Marlo, Mr. Alipate for your patience. <laughs> so Alipate is originally from Tonga, uh, but now living and working in Samoa with the PESA Plus implementation unit. Um, unit. Um, and today he will speak to us about the opportunities that PESA Plus presents for trade and through the movement of natural persons or labor mobility and what this means for Pacific Island women. Mr. Tavo, the floor is now yours. Uh, thank you very much, Cassandra, and greetings to you all. I know there was a reason why uh, you put me in as the last panelist. Uh, so I'll be taking um, the last few minutes just to uh, provide. Uh, very short uh, remarks on how to enable um, market access, e-commerce to rural women, and also the impact of labor mobility. Um, first of all, uh, it is our view that almost all women in the rural area have access to technology and internet, and of course, smartphones. Uh, we notice the internet connection is available and the coverage reaches the villages and also the remote outer islands. So women, young girls and youth in the Pacific, they also tend to have uh, Facebook accounts uh, just simply for communication with family members. So this is the start, a very simple trade e-commerce. Information is readily available on the internet and women can be our access to correct and relevant information. So the technical trade information that we are currently uh, working on on our member countries must be simplified and translated to the local languages just to assist the women and uh, our population at the rural level. Lessons learned. It's always best uh, for rural women to work in a group it strengthens and builds their confidence, pool their expertise and resources. They also act as a support group where they encourage each other. Uh, trainings, there are training, trainings for online mediums. Here we provide online learning management courses on trade priority issues in terms of 
customs and procedures and quarantine issues. Uh, we've heard from Sherry the, the benefits of going to e-commerce, but there are also challenges when the products are going through the borders, when there are border measures, like quarantine measures, and also facilitating trade to customs procedures. In this COVID-19 era, we have witnessed that there's a change in habits and a growing importance of e-commerce. When there's less human contact, social distancing, there are many platforms, uh, business to consumers, consumer to consumer platforms. We've seen here in Samoa, there's a market here online platform. In Toma, there's a Toma garage sale online. There's a buy and sell in Vanuatu, Villa, buy and sell trade. Islands, there's a market, very PNG. So these are the very simple forms of starting e commerce. And there's a lot of women involved in these uh, platforms. And e trade uh, readiness is therefore essential that rural women are well equipped to face the new digital era to avoid the risk of falling behind. Uh, so having said that, there are also a lot of risks involved in e commerce. As some of you are already use of cyber security, online payment gateways, and of course, a lot of transactions are enabled by credit cards, debit cards, which a lot of uh, women in the rural uh, area do not have access to. But there are other platforms that are provided by some tele telecommunication, telecommunication companies like Digital and Waterfall, where they have MyCash, Mtala, where they use those smartphones for payment. Pesa Plus, trade agreement that uh, Pacific Island countries in Australia and New Zealand are involved in, can assist in setting up secure platforms and regulatory frameworks that ensure there's trust when you use e commerce and, of course, change your mindset. There are regional uh, perspectives in starting to, uh, to increase the awareness of e commerce. And there's a lot of infrastructure. And uh, ICT infrastructure, trade logistics, there has to be legal frameworks, uh, electronic payment solutions, uh, of course, the skill development, e commerce, and of course, access to finance. So I'll stop there and I'll uh, move on to the impact of labor mobility, because our time limitation. Um, what is the impact on labor mobility schemes where men are leaving on seasonal work schemes? and the women are left behind. Of course, the objectives are very honorable. It's the overall objective of the community is to earn wages for the family, provide assistance for the families, where the schemes provide temporary employment for the Pacific people. Uh, this naturally leads the women and children to take care of the family, church, community, and other social obligations of the family, like education, home children, of the family, they naturally inherit the duties of the men and youth that have left on these seasonal work schemes. So these schemes have evolved over the years. The duration of work has been extended to longer durations. It used to be just a few months, but now it's gone up to a few years. And women step up and take responsibility to look after the family. And you all know that in the Pacific, when we talk about family, it's not only the immediate family, you know, the mother, the father, and children, but it also includes uh, your in laws, your uncles, aunties, grandparents, cousins, the list goes on. It's the whole kind of thing. Um, women, what we've noticed, noticed is that they work from the heart. They don't only consider income for the family, but they also look at other important matters like or sustainability, and they want to leave a fertile land for their children and their future generation. This is through consultations with a lot of women. Uh, we have also witnessed women groups working the land, using organic farming, traditional mixed farming practices, uh, raising vegetable gardens, chicken pen, piggery, and so forth. But the empowerment we have seen from various farmers throughout the region is from trainings. Trainings, trainings are provided when they target uh, women groups in budgeting, uh, marketing skills, uh, sewing, planting, chicken farming, so forth. 
uh, where some uh, who are top zones, food gardening, greenhouse materials, planting materials, agricultural equipment, and of course, upskilling uh, in terms of uh, flower arrangement, animal husbandry, and the aged care sector. So, training women how to fish, farming of pearls, farming of uh, sea grapes, we will all witness that in the region. So, it all comes back to the famous uh, the proverb you know, if you give a woman a fish, you only feed her for a day. If you teach a woman how to fish, you feed her for a lifetime. So it's more important to teach uh, someone to do something than to do, to do it for them on an ongoing basis. So assistance must be tailor-made to their natural world. Uh, we've got women that live close to the coastal area. Focus could be on fisheries and handicraft. There are, there are areas where pandanus uh, plants and mountain trees uh, grow better. Uh, so assistance could be tailored in that area. We may be closer to the plantation of natural resources. And assistance could be uh, for agriculture. We have uh, certain difficult products in any part. As we've seen, there's a lot of specific traditional products being copied and best produced by bigger developed countries. Uh, women groups have the capability to export, must consider all these trade uh, issues and quarantine requirements, uh, technical issues in terms of standards. We've seen uh, a lot of successful women groups uh, working on regional, regional coconut oil, supplying big giant markets in the UK and the ones, in, ones here in uh, Sabu and Body Shop. So the, these are some, some of the areas could assist also looking at original traditional products and then um, the pricing of these big products for the shipping we've seen fine mats here in Samoa where the pricing goes up to 10,000. Also in Tonga, also in the Cook Islands, we've seen fine uh, bills and fans where the price is very high because of the effort and time given to producing these products. So uh, thank you, Cassandra. I'll just end here because of our time conversation. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello. Uh, it's now 3.09 p.m. Samoa time. And, and what a great session um, this has been. I hope that you had all enjoyed listening and learning from our beautiful and inspirational panelists. It is my pleasure to now hand over the moderator role to Melissa to take us through the second and final part of our webinar. Melissa. Thank you, Cassandra. And thank you to all of our panelists. It's been really insightful and informative and I'm sure that everyone that has participated has enjoyed it as much as me. Um, we do have one question which we'll cover quickly and this is also an opportunity for us to pass back to Catherine who was cut out from the uh, calling in from the Highlands in Papua New Guinea. So Catherine we have a question about where you are exporting PNG coffee to and whether there's a potential to export them to nations like Tuvalu. Um, so perhaps if you can answer that and also feel free to close out any final comments from your presentation that was uh, interrupted earlier. Over to you, Catherine. Uh, thank you. Can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. <laughs> thank you for that question. Um, with, re with regards to export, uh, it, as we speak, since Women in Coffee started out, we have exported to the US of A and to Canada, uh, to the sustainable coffee markets. So the two exports that we've made are green bean, uh, green bean coffee, uh, but there is opportunity actually to do uh, the Pacific uh, trade with the Pacific. We've we've had uh, interest from Fiji, uh, and we've had uh, we've been um, the potential buyer sort of in Fiji wanted some coffee from PNG, and we've had market development facility who's made the connection with uh, one of with 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 uh, Juwaka Coffee Limited. Uh, Emma Wakpi and uh, that conversation is still ongoing. We haven't, uh, she hasn't uh, sent some uh, coffee green bean to Fiji yet. But in terms of um, 
possibility of exporting coffee across the Pacific. If we were exporting coffee, uh, we would send it in the form of green bean for any one of the roasters uh, across the Pacific who's interested to turn green bean to roast bean for to serve up at cafes. Uh, or we could also send across roast beans. Mm -hmm. uh, but that would be on a very small scale. And it's there is a possibility because when women in coffee participated in the uh, review of the Pacific plan, we pushed for export of micro lots. And fortunately, we have a policy in place that's now supported every other person who's doing coffee in PNG to be able to export uh, by via freighting coffee out of PNG. So there is a possibility that that, that can be done. Uh, like I was saying, Women in Coffee is a network, but our members are exporters, processors, uh, growers. So any interest from the Pacific can be facilitated through my office, which is the secretariat, and I can connect we say uh, exporter in this case, it could be uh, Emma from from Juaka Coffee or Maureen or any one of the girls who is into exporting at this point in time. So smaller lots of coffee can be exported across Pacific. Yeah, sorry, mouthful. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. That's inspirational. <laughs> so Lily and there may be a solution for only having instant coffee in Tuvalu. Watch this space. <laughs> Oh, it's too well, yeah. <laughs> um, Thank okay. you, Lillian. If there's no other questions from the floor, we did have one other question, but it has been answered in the Q&A if anybody else is inter interested. Um, it related to the cost of establishing or switching to an e-commerce model for a business operation and how training can be accessed. So if anyone's interested, please have a look at that. Um, and I guess that brings us to the end of our formalities today. And I would just like to thank all of our wonderful panel members for their very insightful and informative discussions today. It really has been useful for me to see the wonderful examples of the role women are playing as seeds of change in their communities and to better understand how we can collectively address some of the barriers that they face across the uh, rural regions in the Pacific. Um, I'd like to end today just drawing it all together with a, a bit of a call for action. I think we've, we've seen um, what wonderful contributions women can make, and we've also had an opportunity to, to discuss some of the barriers and how these um, can be overcome. But I think I'd encourage you, please don't leave this conversation in this Zoom room. But take it home and have the, continue it with your families, your colleagues, your friends, and your partners in, in business and in the community. Because as individuals, we can only make a small ripple in the pond. But if we all join together and drive the change, we can achieve some really great things. So let's all see ourselves as seeds of change in building a forest that brings about equality for women and other disadvantaged groups across the Pacific. I would also really encourage anybody to reach out to us as a program, Farmer Plus, to either connect with our panelists or to learn more about what we're doing, or just to talk about ways that we can continue this conversation and work together. Um, thank you very much for taking the time to join with us. And I hope you've enjoyed this session. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Pass it for from Samoa. The pass it for from Thai Lama. Thanks, Cassandra. Thank you, Thomas. Bye. <laughs>